Hi, everyone, and, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm Scott Wenzel. I'm a project manager for EDF Climate Core at the Environmental Defense Fund. I'll be speaking with you today about some of the trends we're seeing across corporate clean energy programs, as well, about, as, well as about the ways you can accelerate your own clean energy program for your organization. Uh, first, just a couple quick housekeeping announcements. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to submit any questions that you might have during the presentation directly into the chat box or uh, question box in the webinar control panel. My colleague Kathleen Gill will be collecting these and I'll try to address as many of them as I can after the presentation. Great. Okay, to start, just a little bit about Environmental Defense Fund or EDF. We're a nonprofit environmental advocacy organization. We like to think that we work for one client, that's the Earth. Uh, our efforts focus in four key areas, climate, ecosystems, human health, and the world's oceans. I like to think that we're passionate pragmatists. We are always looking for environmental solutions that are both effective as well as scalable. <clears throat> We're comprised of a team of over 500 scientists, economists, lawyers, and business professionals, and we believe strongly in addressing environmental challenges with policies informed by the very best science and economics. One thing that really sets EDF apart from our other environmental NGOs is our work with businesses. Now, we recognize that business is both part of the problem, but really a key part to any solution to address big sustainability challenges. To that end, EDF has pioneered market-based solutions to environmental problems. For instance, we helped to engineer the cap and trade system for acid rain in the Clear Clean Air Act amendments of 1990, which cut pollution faster than anyone expected and at a fraction of the predicted cost. <clears throat> We've really created the model of business NGO partnerships. This is something we've been doing for over 25 years. And when EDF partners with a business, we seek to influence them to bake sustainability into their business operations and across their supply chains. Ultimately, we seek to create success stories that can drive scalable solutions across an entire industry. I think it's important to point out that we actually take no money from the companies that we work with uh, and instead, our partnerships deliver on environmental results. One of our signature programs is EDF Climate Corps. Uh, EDF Climate Corps embeds trained graduate students inside organizations to help them meet their energy goals by accelerating clean energy projects inside their corporate facilities over the course of a summer. Uh, fellows serve as a hands-on advisor, helping to get clean energy projects on the fast track to accomplishment ultimately helping to improve your organization's bottom line, as well as your environmental impact. And even for organizations that have done extensive work already addressing their energy consumption, Climate Corps Fellows are able to come in and inject a fresh perspective, as well as bring new ideas to help take the, or your organization's energy management to the next level. Uh, so it's by embedding these fellows inside hundreds of organizations throughout most sectors of the economy since 2008, that we have this really unique insight into corporate clean energy trends uh, and how American companies are leveraging best practices in energy management for their facilities. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk a little bit about what uh, we're seeing in some of those trends and leading best practices. The first major trend is that energy efficiency is driving significant investment. For every company and organization, the journey really begins with energy efficiency. And many companies have been focusing on, on efficiency for a decade or, or even longer. In fact, according to ACEEE, energy intensity in the United States has decreased 50% since 1980. This represents $800 billion in annual savings relative to a business as usual scenario without any, any ener energy efficiency gains. ACEEE also predicts that there are cost-effective opportunities to reduce energy use by an additional 40 to 60 percent by 2050. This represents a huge investment opportunity for American businesses. In fact, the International Energy Agency reports that energy efficiency investment in buildings in the United States totaled, totaled at least $23 billion in 2014. Non-residential investment by building owners and occupants has seen the largest growth 
uh, with investment almost doubling in just seven years. This is from $7 billion in 2006 to over $13 billion in 2014. This trend should continue. Uh, and so while we've seen many organizations begin to invest in energy efficiency measures, things like adjusting their lighting or HVAC systems, there remain significant untapped opportunities. Every facility, whether it's a factory, a mall, or a corporate office building can benefit from a fresh focus on energy efficiency. And despite all this, energy efficiency retrofits are not always simple or easily identified. <clears throat> To show you an example of this complexity, I wanted to highlight a project from one of our 2015 Climate Corps fellows, Sean Takao, who is embedded with Adidas Group. Adidas set aggressive performance targets for 2015, which included a 20% relative reduction in energy consumption and a 30% relative reduction in carbon emissions. Adidas Group hosted Sean as their EDF Climate Corps fellow to help identify and analyze LED lighting and control systems at two of the company's distribution centers as well as take a look at energy management systems within the company's portfolio of retail stores. But the LED landscape is crowded, and Adidas wanted to select a product and control system that gave them the flexibility to incorporate future upgrades. As you might know, when considering LED upgrades, an organization must weigh multiple criteria, such as whether to pursue proprietary or open source controls, who to procure the hardware from, and how to move forward with installation. So it was after extensive research of the market for LED lighting and control systems that Sean and Adidas settled on a next generation lighting and control system that balanced both flexibility as well as security for Adidas's U.S. distribution center in Spartanburg, South Carolina, as well as their tailor-made production and distribution center in Carlsbad, California. Finally, Sean also analyzed the energy use at the company's retail locations and identified those stores where implementing an energy management system would make the best business case. As you can see, ultimately, these recommended lighting and EMS upgrades could save the Adidas Group $1.4 million annually by reducing energy consumption by nearly 12.4 million kilowatt hours each year. These recommended investments represent a net present value of approximately $4.5 million and could reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more than 8,500 metric tons. As you can see, the procurement of energy efficient technologies and services still is not as simple as it is for other goods or services. And it, it really requires a holistic approach and a long-term vision on the part of the company. The next big trend that we're seeing is the rapid deployment of renewable energy sources. Um, and we're, we're witnessing an increasing number of companies signing large deals to capture the financial savings and stability that renewables offer. So what's driving this trend? Well, for one thing, solar module costs have decreased by 99% since 1975 and 80% since just 2008, and they continue to drop. Over the past 15 years, solar and wind deployment have significantly outpaced just about every serious industry prediction. And through the first three quarters of 2015, 30% of all new electric generating capacity that was brought online in the US came from solar. This is according to Green Tech Media. <clears throat> in fact, installed solar capacity is expected to nearly double between the fourth quarter of 2015 and the fourth quarter of 2016. The recent extent, uh, extension of the federal investment tax credit, as well as the production tax credit, will undoubtedly unleash significant investments in both solar and wind generation through 2020. In particular, utility scale power purchase agreements are expected to get a really big boost. And looking further into, into the future, the International Energy Agency expects that between now and 2040, global investments in renewable energy generation will total $7 trillion. This represents at least 60% of all power plant investments. So given this new regulatory certainty, along with the de declining costs for renewable electricity, coupled with the increasing volatility in traditional energy markets, there's a long and growing list of companies that are making lucrative investments in clean renewable energy. Many organizations have begun to explore on-site renewable projects, typically on a relatively small scale. The economics and feasibility of these projects vary considerably across the country based on state or even local regulations. While these installations are a highly visible commitment to renewables, for many 
organizations on-site resources are unable to meet a sizable portion of their energy load, at least given current technologies. The growth in large off-site power purchase agreements is at least in part a response to this factor. <clears throat> a great example of a company that's made an aggressive commitment to renewable energy is Nestle, which has a goal to power all of its operations with 100% renewable energy. This past summer, EDF Climacore worked with Nestle Waters North America, a beverage division that has 12 bottled water brands in its portfolio of products. In 2015, Nestle Waters enlisted the help of an EDF Climate Corps fellow, Kayla Fenton, to advance the procurement of renewable energy through power purchase agreements. As a founding member of the Rocky Mountain Institute's Business Renewable Center, Nestle understands the economic and environmental value of switching to renewable power, and they've already begun to incorporate some renewables, but their progress to date has been a bit limited because of the complexity of these renewable power purchase agreements as well as due to cost concerns. Kayla, with the support of the Nestle team, focused her efforts on analyzing the potential for off-site power purchase agreements for facilities in both Texas and Pennsylvania. After collecting power consumption and rate data for facilities in these states, Nestle Waters issued a request for proposals to the renewable power sector in the targeted markets. Kayla also formed connections with other Nestle companies operating in the US, to help align renewable purchasing strategies across the entire Nestle brand. And after receiving over 40 proposals, Kayla and the Nestle team completed an initial financial analysis to determine the potential cost savings and environmental benefits for each opportunity. It's estimated that by switching to renewable power at just two of its facilities, Nestle Waters is positioned to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by about 42,000 metric tons per year and energy-related water consumption by about 48 million gallons per year. Once implemented, this project could increase Nestle Water's share of renewable power by nearly 15%. As companies and organizations have become leaner through energy efficiency and cleaner through renewable energy procurement, they've also grown in sophistication in how they approach energy management. A trend we're seeing across industries is the use of complex data management systems to inform decision making. This is everything from leveraging data to target energy conservation measures to automating entire building systems. We live in a time of unprecedented data collection, and this big data can provide vital information for understanding energy use and consumption within your facilities or even individual systems. According to the organization Mission Data, there are currently 60 million smart meters deployed across the United States, and there are countless companies that are providing increasingly valuable products and services to help you manage and use this energy data. This sort of data, when coupled with smart building management systems and a well-trained staff, can drive incredible energy and cost savings. For instance, energy data can be analyzed to optimize the performance of your buildings and equipment in real time. It can also allow you to automate aspects of your building operations and even manage your peak demand charge. An example of the value of energy data can be seen in a recent project that EDF Climate Corps worked on with Iron Mountain, a storage and information management services company. In 2015, Iron Mountain enlisted EDF Climate Corps fellow Zhang Tai Park to identify HVAC and power management opportunities that could be scaled across Iron Mountain's 600 plus North American facilities. Given the large number of facilities and possible energy projects to examine, Park turned to energy data to estimate the energy consumption pattern of Iron Mountain's facilities by specific end use. Using this model, Park determined that lighting upgrades, HVAC system control management, and office, and office power management, equipment power management, presented the greatest opportunities. This sort of analysis would not have been possible without the use of large energy data sets. Um, and, it, and if implemented, all of the projects that Park identified could save Iron Mountain nearly $6.5 million annually cut over 58 million kilowatt hours of electricity per year and avoid approximately 3,500 metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions. Iron Mountains incorporated parks research into its energy planning uh, for this year, for 2016. 
So leading organizations are already tackling the three steps that I just listed. And for many, the next step is to bring the same level of rigor to their supply chain impacts. Tackling supplier energy use and scope three GHG emissions is increasingly a large part of many corporate sustainability goals. And while this is certainly a trend among top tier companies, there's actually some worrying evidence of backsliding in supplier engagement more broadly. CDP found in their 2015 supply chain report uh, that only 50% of suppliers engaged with their value chain partners. This is down from 56% in 2013. Ultimately, to maintain a competitive advantage and to address the concerns of large investors, companies will need to continue to find innovative ways to engage with their suppliers. Um, we think that one key way for companies to really engage with these suppliers and, and realize energy efficiency gains is to bring in a partner organization or some other uh, partner on the ground to help provide the know-how and resources to make the needed changes. The work that New Balance is doing is a great example of how companies can provide technical assistance to a supplier through partnership. New Balance Athletics enlisted a Climate Corps fellow, Ian Huang, to help its supplier, CJ2, conduct an energy performance assessment and reduce energy use at a manufacturing site in China. New Balance wanted this supplier to reduce its carbon emissions by at least 10% by 2018. After working with the supplier to analyze energy use, Ian and the CJ2 energy team determined that fixing compressed air leaks and implementing high efficiency motors or variable frequency drives offered the most promising opportunities. These actions could not only reduce energy use significantly, but also enhance operational performance. Ian also introduced a regular training program to engage and educate site production leaders about raising energy performance. Ian's project recommendations could save this supplier a considerable, considerable amount of electricity, abating 423 metric tons of carbon dioxide emissions annually. The project could also generate nearly 200,000 US dollars in net operational savings. At the end of the fellowship, the supplier committed to periodic energy performance self-assessments and was on track in terms of implementing these projects as well as meeting New Balance's energy management goals. The next and final trend is around disclosure and goal setting. Companies have been disclosing their climate impacts for, for quite some time now, and through a variety of channels, those including CDP, corporate sustainability reports, and other forms of integrated financial and ESG reporting. In 2015, over 5,500 companies across the world disclosed to CDP. This is significant growth from 2003 when only 221 companies responded. The sheer volume of disclosure is an old but continuing trend. I think the more, entren the more important trend is in how the act of disclosure has precipitated this positive feedback loop on corporate climate change actions. You can see that CDP's ranking relies heavily on corporate GHG performance rather than simple disclosure. And companies are increasingly reporting not only on their overall climate impact, but they're setting public goals and then reporting on progress year over year. This trend will undoubtedly continue with a growing focus on supply chain impacts and risks. The system also serves to publicly hi highlight those companies that have not yet participated in disclosure or begun to set emission reduction targets. Information that's already driving investment decisions. Um, nearly two thirds of, in of institutional investors surveyed by Ernst Young in 2015 indicated that companies are not adequately disclosing environmental, social, and governance risks. They also found that more than one third of these investors actually took steps to cut holdings due to stranded asset risk in the past year. This phenomenon is not limited to the fossil fuel sector as most would assume. Uh, for instance, real estate represents a significant stranded asset risk due to rising sea levels, changing weather patterns and occupational changes. A simple conclusion is that companies that publicly disclose their energy and carbon impacts are much more likely to set and achieve aggressive reduction targets. Their executives are more engaged and sustainability slowly becomes core to everyday business uh, actions. Disclosure also helps to paint a better picture of current practices across an entire industry and better data leads to the faster adoption of best practices. In a sense, disclosure helps to create a race to the top 
a trend that benefits everyone. So through the course of this discussion on trends, I've run through uh, several examples from the EDF Climate Corp program. Uh, just quickly, in case your organization might also be able to benefit from a Climate Corp fellow, I wanted to quickly run through how to get involved for next summer, or this summer, I should say. Uh, the basic requirements are to first pay the fellow's salary and some travel expenses, which work out to about $15,000 for a 10-week fellowship. Uh, and this is well worth the in in investment as EDF Climate Corps fellows are, are highly skilled and, and well-trained graduate students. We also ask that organizations provide a high-level project sponsor and a direct supervisor, and that they ensure the fellow has access to relevant information and staff that they'll need to perform their duties. I think it's important, again, to highlight that EDF does not accept any money from the companies that we work with, so there's no additional cost to participate beyond paying the fellow's salary. To sign up, you just need to complete a basic application, which can be found on our website. These are due by February 5th, but if you're thinking about participating, I would encourage you to secure your spot sooner rather than later, so we can begin screening student applicants for your project. Okay, to wrap things up, uh, in conclusion, the clean energy industry is evolving really quickly, and there are significant business opportunities to be had for uh, opportunistic companies. It all starts with energy efficiency, and top companies continue to mine for efficiency savings because there's always more to be done, and by leveraging data from smarter building management and energy management systems, they continue to find more and more opportunities. Uh, technology costs uh, will continue to come down, and, and so will installation costs, and in many areas, incentives or rebates are increasing or changing. Next, with a lower energy baseline, companies are able to meet an increasing portion of their load with renewables, and power purchase agreements are a vehicle for locking in long-term stability and low prices. Companies are collecting and analyzing energy data in order to be more strategic in how they approach energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. Disclosing energy and climate impact data publicly is a key way to communicate corporate responsibility to your investors and to your other stakeholders. <clears throat> and finally, it's really hard to do this work alone. Companies are partnering with an NGO or joining a business coalition to access the expertise needed to get the job done both within their own operations as well as across their supply chains. Climate Corps has helped hundreds of businesses along this journey, and I'd be happy to speak with any of you after the presentation if you're interested in learning more. Um, and with that, thank you, and I welcome any questions. Um, Kathleen, I guess I'll turn it over to you. Do you have any questions that have come through? Hi, Scott. Yeah, there are a few that are coming through right now. Um, First question I see here is, um, so who, who are these fellows and, and how do you get them to, to work on these projects? Great. Um, well, thank you. So EDF Climate Corps fellows are, are graduate students. So this is essentially uh, an internship for, for graduate students. They come from uh, top graduate programs all over the country. Um, they're focusing their studies on uh, business, on engineering, on environmental studies and sustainability, on policy, and, and on many other energy-related fronts. Um, and, you know, they, they share as a common goal to ultimately work in corporate sustainability and or energy. So they're applying to EDF and, and looking to be deployed with companies and other large organizations across the country to, again, help make that business case to accelerate a wide variety of energy-related projects. Great. And then uh, we've got another question here. Uh, at what point in a company's sustainability journey um, or energy policy progress do you re recommend to hire uh, a Climate Corps fellow? Well, that's a great question. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll answer that by giving sort of a quick genesis story of Climate Corps. So we, we started the program in 2008. Uh, focus specifically on energy efficiency. And, and if, if folks can remember what the energy landscape looked like in 2008, it was very different than it was today. Um, most companies were just starting to look at energy efficiency as, as a resource. They um, often did not have on-site staff dedicated to this. 
and you know utility incentive programs were very very different back then um so we were born as a kind of hands-on resource to help move basic energy efficiency projects forward and, and we're still uh, to some extent uh, working on those types of projects with businesses so these are companies and other organizations that are just just getting started on their energy management journey and then there are organizations that we've worked with more or less since 2008 and they are um, at the leading edge of corporate sustainability and corporate greenhouse gas management. And they've largely been the organizations that have been um, pointed to as, as case studies uh, for how to manage energy effectively. And, and we have Climate Corps fellows that are supporting those organizations on um, sort of their next steps within the journey, how to, again, uh, delve deeper into renewables, how to uh, drives uh, sustainability and energy efficiency throughout their supply chains, how to engage their workforce in this in, in these efforts. So um, at the end of the day, I think a Climate Corps fellow can plug in regardless of where a company is on their journey, because really we're just talking about a, a very, very bright graduate student that can support um, whatever it is that you're working on. Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, and I've got a question here a little bit about Funding. Mm -hmm. So the fellow stipend is 15 k. Mm -hmm. um, are there any uh, discounts for pub public sector organizations, um, or could you talk a little bit more about um, finding funding um, in the public sector? Great. Um, so it's a tough question to answer. We we do dedicated fundraising um, at EDF to support some targeted projects with nonprofits and public sector organizations um, around the country. That support is always limited. It's, it's never enough. Um, and unfortunately, this year, we've largely allocated that funding. So for organizations uh, in the public sector that are looking to get involved, there, there are a few other options. And one, obviously, would be to hire the fellow using internal funding. It's something we've seen some public sector and nonprofit organizations able to do. Um, perhaps more likely, uh, we've seen many organizations partner with a local foundation or some sort of corporate philanthropy um, to uh, acquire the funding necessary to hire a Climate Corps fellow. And if anyone's interested in, in, in learning more about that, I'd be happy to talk offline about that. Great. Um, a question more specifically about the, the Nestle project. Mm -hmm. I just uh, Wondering more about how they collect and analyze and manage their energy data. Um, if you're familiar with with how they did that, I'm not entirely sure the specific systems that they have in place. But um, I guess speaking more broadly, how I would advise a company to go about doing this, it, it largely begins with um, energy billing data, which gives you a, a really rough sense of um, you know your overall demand. And in some cases, that can be enough to go to a, um, a renewable, to, to begin looking for renewable contracts. My guess is that they actually have more granular data than that. I don't know. Um, most likely, they're, they're looking at 15-minute interval data for these facilities, uh, as well as seasonal variations within that, um, that you, data set to try to understand where um, their peaks are uh, so that they can bring that information to uh, the renewable developer to sign a contract that meets their demand. Um, and then as part of that, they'll work with the local util utilities to provide firming, which essentially means that they'll, um, utilities are going to provide electricity regardless of uh, what their um, demand is. And uh, essentially, that's what a power purchase agreement. There's no direct wire connecting um, the renewable generation source to the factory, or in this case, the Nestle facility. All right, our next question here is, how can I get a better understanding of where my organization is um, on its energy journey and improvements that could be made on my end? Um, there's lots of uh, readily available free resources. Um, EPA Energy Star is a great way to start benchmarking your properties. Um, and they have just gargantuan data sets of similar uh, facilities, similar types of infrastructure and how they um, stand 
in terms of their energy management, their overall energy consumption. So by engaging with EPA Energy Star, you can get a sense of where you stand relative to your peers. Um, and then EDF Climate Corps actually has a tool called the Smart Energy Diagnostic, which again is a benchmarking tool uh, rather than geared towards comparing your actual energy consumption to a peer organization, it's it's more uh, tuned to benchmarking your management practices. So it'll look at how your organization approaches energy decision making and compare that to um, sort of the best practices that we've seen in the industry. And, and that's publicly available on our website. Great. Um... Can you talk a little bit more about the benefits and disadvantages of on-site renewables versus renewable PPAs? Sure. Um, so on-site renewables uh, have the advantage of uh, most likely being behind your meter. So um, there's lots of advantages that can that, that to be had because of that. So uh, for instance, uh, large solar array on your roof, um, it's pumping out electricity during the typically the hottest, sunniest part of the day during the summer, which for most facilities coincides with their peak. So you get immediate benefits there. Um, it's also highly visible. So if you're a retailer or you know a public facing company, having solar on your facility is, is one way to communicate with your, your customers, your stakeholders that you're committed to these efforts. Um, there's also, uh, depending on how you structure these deals, if you own the assets, there's uh, advantages to depreciation and, and things like that. Um, the advantage of an offsite deal, one is, is, you know, it's not on your infrastructure. You don't have to worry about maintenance. You don't have to worry about your roof uh, being able to bear the weight of a solar array, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these can be much, much larger uh, installations and, you know, sort of due to economies of scale, the electricity that you would be purchasing from them um, can be significantly less expensive. Um, there, there are advantages and disadvantages to both. I, I think it depends on what your company's looking to achieve. Um, the, the Business Renewable Center is a great place to turn for large power purchase agreements, and they have some really good resources that can guide um, guide you know, further development of those. And we've, we've seen uh, EDF Climate Corps fellows help sort of make that distinction between power purchase agreements and on-site renewables as well. Great. Um, you presented on what you see as current trends. What do you see as some future or emerging trends? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think it'll come probably as no surprise that battery storage is um, is probably already already a trend, and it will uh, increasingly become a large trend over the next few years. Um, battery storage costs are coming down dramatically. They're following sort of a similar technology curve as solar. Um, there are all kinds of advantages and, and, and it, battery storage starts to bridge all of these sort of disparate small industries. Um, they're a great way for uh, solar developers to add value to their projects. Um, energy information companies that are doing sort of demand response or other uh, energy analytics um, have access to a whole new tool through battery storage that can drive significant value within a company. Utilities, for the most part, like battery storage because it's a, a demand side resource that um, they can potentially control that can uh, really help manage uh, load fluctuations on the grid. Um, so you know, I think if we're giving this presentation in a couple of years, you'll hear me talking quite a bit about battery storage. I'd say the other trend is just in how businesses are engaging with their utility partners. Um, I think for many years, companies uh, accepted the status quo that they purchased electricity from their local utility and that the local utility was always acting on their behalf. I think now companies uh, have diverging views on renewable energy, on the cost of that electricity, on their ability to make decisions related to their energy procurement. So we're seeing companies that are approaching utilities in regulated markets that are more or less demanding access to renewable electricity. Uh, I think in you know the southern states where renewables haven't made as much progress, we're we're seeing companies that are 
uh, approaching large utilities and, and basically structuring pass-through tariffs or green tariffs that allow the utility to build a large utility scale uh, renewable generation source, typically solar, perhaps wind, um, and then baking the costs of that into a 20 or 30 year contract with the large off taker, the, that large company. Um, and it's a way for companies to get access to renewable electricity in a regulated, regulated market where they don't have access to um, retail or wholesale power providers. I think this is a trend that you'll continue to see and there'll be growing pressure on those recalcitrant uh, utilities that aren't providing these services. All right, um, let's see here. Would Climate Core work for uh, a situation where there are multiple office buildings owned by a single owner? Oh, yes, absolutely. We've um, we've worked with a number of real estate companies uh, on projects that focus on sort of portfolio level engagement or multiple buildings that uh, a fellow can do sort of deeper dives into. So that's, that's certainly an opportunity. Great. And is it possible to make a donation to EDF and have the charity pay Climate Corps fellows rather than Climate Corps fellow being paid directly by the company? So again, as, as part of our sort of mission or our charter, we're unable to accept funding from a company. Um, and I, we're pretty firm on that. Um, we've seen models where a company has made a charitable donation to another nonprofit um, or to a school district or something to that effect. And the fellow has then been hired by that nonprofit or school district to do work for those organizations. Um, companies can also hire fellows through a staffing agency. But EDF is unable to be a sort of pass-through vehicle for those funds. Um, the, the one exception to that would be if we're working with a nonprofit, we would be able to accept money uh, from a nonprofit. All right, that's all we've got for questions. Uh, it looks like there are a couple, multiple questions in one question. So if you feel like uh, your question wasn't answered, that's something that Scott and I can follow up with you after the webinar. Great. Well, thank you, Kathleen, and, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I really appreciate your attendance and looking forward to hearing from you. Please feel free to send us feedback. Take care.